Bob Miller. It is so good to have you back. You get the honor of being my first guest that gets at number two. And I we're going to do a number three next month, too, because we had the most views of any of the live episodes so far was the last one. So any of you who are watching, first of all, welcome. Um, I'll introduce Bob Miller if you don't know him already in just a minute. Um, but his uh, first episode you can find on my uh, Facebook page or on my YouTube channel. And my YouTube channel is, is um, now has over 20 episodes and um, they are great, but Bob's is one of the best. I know you're going to enjoy it. So be, please be sure to go back there, watch our first episode. Today, we're going to talk about NAD and we're going to dive into what that is, what it means for your health and why it might be the most important thing that you hear this year in regards to your health and overcoming chronic disease. Um, just a little background, um, you can get free blogs, free information on my website, just jillcarnahan.com. And later we're going to be talking about an upcoming conference that Bob is putting on and his events are just fantastic. So we will talk about that. You'll definitely want to save the date. Um, this will be recorded here so you can watch it. You can share it with your friends um, or your colleagues. And of course, it will be on my YouTube channel. So welcome, Bob Miller. And I'm going to give a little introduction in case anyone didn't hear the first one. You've got such a wonderful bio. He's uh, Bob Miller is a traditional naturopath specializing in the field of genetic specific nutrition. And what you'll find about Bob is he goes deep. He's got the sign. He's got the mind of a engineer electrician we talked about. Yes. And um, I love that because I do too. And it's pathways and it's processes. And these things all come together and give us really great information on how to help our patients and clients. He earned his traditional naturopathic degree at the Trinity School of Natural Health and is board certified through the ANMA. In 93, he opened the Tree of Life practice where he served as traditional nat naturopath for 27 years. Um, for the past several years, he's been engaged exclusively in functional nutrition, genetic variants, and related research. And some of the pathways he puts together, some of the, um, the conclusions about what causes what, what intervenes nutritionally at this pathway level, it's been so helpful to practitioners like myself because we get these complex patients and the medicine we're taught, at least in my allopathic background, is a one-size-fits-all. And as we know more than ever, it doesn't work that way. Um, every patient that we see in front of us is different genetically, spiritually, emotionally, physically. And so this really takes into account the genetic and individual variation of our patients. And I find, Bob, that a lot of the stuff you teach and that we learn with these pathways helps us to make little tweaks and breakthroughs that make all the difference in their care. Um, you can find his full bio on his website, uh, which what's your website, um, Bob? Oh, tolhealth.com. Perfect, tolhealth.com and information there. But we will, without further ado, jump in um, to everything about NAD. And if you wanted to share your slides, we can do that now as well. Um, okay, we're going to do a screen share. And again, uh, what a pleasure to be, uh, to be back here. We had so much fun uh, the last time. It was... Uh, Absolutely, uh, absolutely incredible. And I'm so honored that uh, so many people uh, watched it. So uh, we're going to dig right in. As you said, uh, we're going we're gonna to geek out here a little bit. Yes. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, why supporting your NAD plus and NAD pH levels may be your key to longevity and, uh, and health. Now, we're going to talk about these molecules. But first, I want to say they're critical for many things. First, for detoxification. And as you know, Jill, we're living in a world that's uh, more toxic than it's ever been. Mm -hmm. We need to have energy production. We're going to talk a little bit about mTOR and autophagy, the growth of cells and the cleaning of cells, supporting sirtuins, which perhaps a lot of people haven't heard about, and recharging our antioxidants. Now, let's just get into a little bit of the theory behind it. Uh, in metabolism, NAD+, plus, nicotamide, adenine dinucleotide. It's involved in redox reactions and transferring electrons, because when you really get down to it, we really are an electrical being. Uh, you know, Einstein told us a long time ago, equals mc squared, energy and mass are interchangeable. A little hard to grasp, but that's what we are. Now, NAD plus is an oxidizing agent, and it accepts electrons from other molecules and becomes reduced, and this forms NADH which can be used as a reducing agent to donate electrons. And of course, we all know that in the, uh, the Krebs cycle, uh, at the top of the electron transport chain, that's how we make our, uh, our ATP. So they have a critical role in maintaining homeostasis. And then we're gonna be talking about 
NADPH, which is actually synthesized from NAD and has uh, similar functions. Now let's talk a little bit about these. Uh, they're fundamental common mediators of various biological processes. As we said, energy metabolism, mitochondria, that's where we make our energy, calcium homeostasis. To me, this is the key one right here. Antioxidant, it actually takes your antioxidants after they do their job, they become oxidized, and we'll talk about this more later, and recycles them. But it wears two hats. You will actually generate oxidative stress. And I'm gonna just get into that a little bit today, but that's gonna be the, the primary thing we're gonna be talking about in our August interview, how NADPH is actually used to make free radicals and why I believe that this is getting out of balance because of genetic and epigenetic factors, all the things that we've done. We're gonna look back someday on some of the things we've done to our environment and say, oops, what were we thinking? Yeah, and Bob, I just wanna comment here because in my mind, I always think about like glutathione, we've known about oxidized reduced, it goes in this cycle. Would you say that we're looking at, it's totally different, but it's a parallel cycle of we need oxidized reduced states. And if either one of these states gets imbalanced, we lose our ability to basically recycle those enzymes. Is that correct? Sure. Absolutely. Let's take a peek here while we're on that subject. Perfect. So here is glutathione, the master antioxidant. We have to have it. It's part of glutathione conjugation, and I'll be talking about that a little bit. After it does its job, it becomes oxidized. So if it sits here and doesn't recycle, it will combine with oxygen to make superoxide. Then it'll combine with nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite, a very strong oxidizing agent. So for this to happen properly, you know, what we have to have here is adequate amounts of NADPH. Yes. Because that NADPH takes your oxidized back to your reduced. So if that doesn't happen, boom, down here into an oxidizing agent. So that's why many times people are so confused. They've got inflammation some well-meaning practitioner says, oh, I'm gonna fix you up. I'm gonna give you some glutathione. They feel better for a couple of days and then they start tanking. And sometimes people are told, well, that can't be happening because this is a master antioxidant. If you don't have enough of this guy, you're gonna go down this pathway. So that's why I'm so excited about uh, NADPH. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's a critical, critical and Bob, I just want to mention, because again, you hit the nail on the head for probably so many people watching today. And I'm one of those people, we've talked about this before, where I, you know, had this massive mold exposure 2015, got so sick. And of course, glutathione, what do you do? Well, I did not tolerate it at all. And back then, five years ago, I didn't understand why. All I knew was I got way, way worse when I would take glutathione. And I know some of you listening are having that experience and it doesn't make sense. This is part of understanding why that happens and why you need to really make sure it's like carts and horses and you have to have things in order and if you just push the end product you may not get where you want to get and you may actually cause more harm or more damage now i'd have a question real quick here what i found for my personal journey that was that precursors of glutathione were fairly safe and tolerated like glycine and vitamin c and selenium and um any any um c and even alpha lipoic acid in small amounts um, if someone's trying to replenish their nad would that be a safer way to go than giving loads of glutathione? Well, let's first talk about your, your selenium. You know, your selenium is part of recycling your glutathione as well. Yeah. So selenium will help the, uh, the glutathione peroxidase recycle. So and if again, they were low on selenium, could they also have trouble with the recycling? Oh, sure. Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't have it on a chart right here, but the, yeah. uh, the selenium is part of recycling what's called glutathione peroxidase, mm -hmm. which clears hydrogen peroxide. Now, you talked about some of the precursors. Uh, glycine right here. Uh, so glutathione is made from glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. Now, one of the interesting things is the uh, sometimes people have a genetic mutation that on this gene right here, GCLM and GCLC, if they do, that cysteine does not come down here. And in some instances, this can combine with iron to yes. make hydroxyl radicals. So then cysteine doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And then also uh, glycine sometimes stimulates the NMDA receptors and can make the person more anxious. 
And then finally, here's the GSS enzyme. If this enzyme is not working properly, you're not gonna make the glutathione from. And then to make it just a little bit more complex, something called NERF2 and KEEP1 control all of these. So if you've got weakness in KEEP1 and NERF2, they're not turning these enzymes on. And let me just mention what a miracle we are. I give the analogy NERF2 and KEEP1 is kind of like a sprinkler system. In a rough sense, think of KEEP1 as the sprinkler, NERF2 kind of like what turns on the water. So when oxidative stress comes along, KEEP1 says, hey, we got a fire here, folks. Let's turn on these enzymes to make more glutathione. I mean, what a miracle we are, the way the body actually responds and reacts. Mutations here can impact that. And that's why I call it the 3D chess game played underwater. So many factors that intertwine. And there just aren't easy answers. There, there really aren't. Well, and yeah. I want to comment, if you're a practitioner listening or a patient, what's so easy to do is you want a one size fits all. You want the cookbook. What's the formula, Dr. Jill? And I just want to reiterate what, what Bob's saying here is there is no formula. It really has to be individualized. And I always get nervous when people have a one size fits all trick. It just doesn't, none of those things work for everyone. And this is why some of the variants that we have genetically in processing different nutrients and our depletions and things and our toxic exposures all play into this. Absolutely. 3D chess game played underwater, as we said. <laughs> now, let's talk about NADPH in what are some of the other things it does. I'm sure people have heard of nitric oxide. Uh, Nobel Prize winning back in the uh, 1980s. Not only is it vasodilative, but it's also anti-inflammatory and does many other processes inside the body. If we don't have enough NADPH, we don't make nitric oxide. And this is where people will have cold hands and feet or Raynaud's high blood pressure, erectile dysfunction, uh, cardiovascular disease. Many people have never heard of thriodoxin, but it's a very important antioxidant. And again, it takes the oxidized back to the reduced. Not enough NADPH, that doesn't happen. Now we just talked about glutathione. However, many people don't know about this. NADPH is needed to take heme and turn it into ferritin. So heme is where the body takes iron by the fetch enzyme and makes the heme. And when the heme is aged, the uh, what's called the, uh, the HMOX enzyme takes heme, puts it into ferritin. Well, if we don't have enough NADPH, that doesn't happen. So the iron gets dumped, becomes a free radical, and the ferritin is low. And then if you think, oh, my ferritin is low, let me take more iron. If that's what's happening, you can just again make more inflammation. Then heme also makes something called biliverdin, which is a very powerful antioxidant that actually calms down mast cells. And so many individuals now, everyone's talking about mast cell activation. Well, this could certainly be because of environmental factors. That'll primarily be what we'll be talking about in August. All of the environmental factors that stimulate the mast cells. But we need biliverdin to calm that down. And then we also turn heme into carbon monoxide, which interestingly stimulates uh, the NERF2. So now you can see why I am so excited about, uh, about NADPH when you look at all the functions uh, that it does. Now, this is fascinating. Um, you know, 12, 15 years ago, we started learning about MTHFR and C677 and A1298. And everything you've heard about that is correct. It's what puts a methyl group on the folate. And we all know that we need folate for so many things, for making our SAMI, our methylation. You know, it's needed by pregnant women. And I won't go into all of the details of this. You know, somebody can read this slide later. But what's interesting, if we don't have enough NADPH, taking folate actually shifts the balance towards oxidation. So... Once again, somebody says, oh, I have MTHFR, I need to take methylfolate. They feel great for two or three weeks, and then they start feeling anxious, angry, and inflamed. Yes. And they don't know why. And uh, to this day, I still see people that, oh, I saw somebody and says, I have to, I have MTHFR, I need to take methylfolate. My answer is maybe. Uh, because if you don't have things lined up properly, uh, Folate will actually stimulate what's called mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, which of course is needed 
uh, for the growth of new cells. So that's why pregnant women need it. But interestingly, a lot of people don't know this, but the COVID virus hijacks mTOR for replication. Mm -hmm. So if our mTOR is running too high, you know, there's the potential here that we could give uh, COVID an opportunity to, uh, to replicate too fast. So that's why before I give people folate, it's like, let's make sure we've got enough in ADPH. And I'm sure you've probably seen lots of people that were told they need methylfolate, they took it and they felt worse. Yeah, Bob, and I just want to comment because back uh, when I was 25, a long time ago, I had breast cancer. Oh, that was three years ago, right? Yeah, just three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, all that to say, I found out I had methylation issues. I had one copy of the C677. I was low in B12 and methylfolate. And of course, what do we do? And this was years ago. I didn't have all the understanding that we do today. I took methylfolate. And this was after the cancer, but as we talked about through mTOR, it can actually without NAD appropriate levels, which I'm sure I've been depleted all my life until recently, um, I actually created more cells and had more um, breast lumps that they thought were potential for issues. And that was all because I had really pushed some high doses of methylfolate. So you can really get into trouble with even cancer or precancerous or fibromas or cystic things um, with this process as well. And you want to work with a practitioner who understands and not just push methylfolate without the other precursors. The other thing you said that I think is very relevant is the mTOR is hijacked by COVID. Now we've seen some evidence that perhaps um, patients who are really into bodybuilding and pushing mTOR with amino acids and some of the peptides and raptamycin. So there's all these things that a lot of the anti-aging groups are doing to push mTOR. And could it be that some of those people are a little higher risk for complications of COVID we don't know for sure, but some of the evidence is pointing to the fact that that might be true. And this yes, is absolutely. Why. Yeah, now's not the time to be pushing mTOR, in my opinion. If it Agreed. doesn't make any difference, well, it doesn't matter. But if it does, I'd rather be safe than sorry. Yes, yes. So and the opposite, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, Bob, I just want to mention for practical terms, the opposite mTOR is autophagy when your body, when your cells are actually eating up the bad guys that are doing the wrong uh, signaling and going to go down a wrong pathway, your body says, hey, you need to kill yourself and that's autophagy. So autophagy and mTOR are always balanced and we want that balanced. And one of the things, and Bob, I'd love to know if there's other things that you know of, but one of the things that helps autophagy is fasting. So that's one reason why intermittent fasting can be helpful to balance that mTOR autophagy pathway. Sure. Well, let's uh, let's take a quick peek at that while we're on that subject. Let me just uh, pull in the uh, maps and charts here. So let's take. A you peek are at so that. good at finding the details that we. <laughs> I love it right on the spot. <laughs> but I think yeah. it's important and practical for those listening. So I love that you brought yeah. that up. There we go. The beautiful mTOR chart. Yes. So uh, so let's look at the mTOR chart. So this is uh, actually what I did when I, on a, one of my studies in 2018 on Lyme disease. So, and one of my things that I, that I really believe is happening, as you said, mTOR is the growth of new cells. Okay. So we have mTOR growing new cells mm -hmm. and we have autophagy cleaning the cells. And interestingly, autophagy, we believe takes out the, the virus as well. Mm -hmm. Now, what have we done in our environment? We have all these plastics that are creating xenoestrogens. What do they do? They stimulate mTOR. So as you said, some of these protein drinks and things. And I think we're going to look back someday and say, what were we thinking giving our animals growth hormones? Well, they'll get fatter faster and we can make more money. Yes, but that gets passed on to more mTOR. Higher levels of glucose and insulin. Iron will stimulate it. Methionine and SAMI. Glutamate. And of course, folate. And that's why, of course, women who are pregnant need folate because if they don't have fast reproduction, they're not gonna make the new baby. So they'll either not get pregnant, have a miscarriage or deformity. So during pregnancy, you wanna push that mTOR. But if you're not pregnant and you're concerned about inflammation, uh, pushing mTOR too much can be a problem. So you talked about uh, intermittent fasting. Well, of course, when you stop the amino acids, the, uh, the carbohydrates, the iron, the glutamate, the folate, I give the analogy, think of mTOR as the construction crew and it's building. When you take away the materials, it says, well, I can't do any building. Okay, janitors come out and do your job. And that's what they do. The janitors, so to speak, come out and start cleaning. And I found in my one study on Lyme disease, those that were chronically ill with Lyme had epigenetic and genetic factors 
that threw them into mTOR dominance. And I think you said intermittent fasting right there, ketogenic diet, but also um, resveratrol, turmeric will slow down mTOR, while lithium, vitamin D, and berberine support uh, the AMPK enzyme that supports autophagy. And I believe we have just done so much in our environment and even cytokines, you know, we're getting more cytokines now because of inflammation. They're all stimulating the, uh, the mTOR to our, our detriment. Again, that's why I believe we're seeing such great results with intermittent fasting and the, uh, and the ketogenic uh, diet. Thanks for going over that. I think that's so important for people to understand the balance. Absolutely. Here. Yes. So I'm glad to, uh, Go down that uh, little bunny trail there. It was a good one. Now, this is how we make NADPH. So tryptophan, which, you know, most people know about, that's, you know, what we get in our turkey. Uh, most people know that goes into serotonin, but it will also go down this direction by TDO, IDO1, and IDO2. Well, if we've got genetic mutations here, this pathway may not be as robust. And there's a scientist doing some research. I'd love to do an interview with him. But he believes when there's mutations here, this is where you get the excess serotonin. Mm -hmm. And you don't get it moving down through here. And this is the de novo pathway, more enzymes, more mutations there. And then quinolinic acid. Now, this induces NMDA receptor-mediated lipid peroxidation and anxiety. So when people have mutations in QPRT, these are the people that are getting hit in two ways. Their quinolinic acid is too high, and then they're not getting the NAD that they need. Now, a lot of people are learning about nicotamide riboside and nicotamide mononucleotide and even niacin. Okay, this is what comes down through, through NMNAT, and as we age, this is what, uh, this is what weakens for us, and therefore, we don't get as much NAD. Now, interestingly, NAD then, NAD plus can go up to NADH, or it can come down to NADPH. One of the mutations that we find very clinically significant is NQ01, because this is the NADH to NAD plus. And when, you're, when these are out of balance, this is when people are in a hyper state, tremors, migraines, uh, because they're not getting down through here. Now, I'm going to talk about this more, but NAD plus also supports PARP, which is DNA repair. So as our DNA gets damaged, PARP jumps in and says, I need to do some repair. So bottom line is here, there's a lot that can go wrong here in making your uh, NAD plus. And again, same thing. We are learning about all the benefits of NAD, and I'm going to talk about more of them. So we tend to think, gee, the more nicotamide riboside or more nicotamide mononucleotide I take, the better off I am. Sometimes. Same as methylfolate. So let's, let's dig just a little bit deeper. And this is a, a complex chart that we really don't need to get into the, a lot of the details. But NAD plus stimulates what's called the search ones, which are involved in uh, longevity. And part of it is because they make SOD and catalase. And I'll be showing a chart on that in a little bit. These are major antioxidants that neutralize free radicals. And if you've got way too many free radicals going on, you know, you're going to age prematurely. And as we spoke about, here's the NADH and energy production. And then my favorite, NADPH. And I want to get into this again later. Recycle your antioxidants or free radical production. To me, that is what is so fascinating. This guy will either help you make antioxidants or make you make more free radicals. To me, that's uh, fascinating. And the whole premise of our research being that I believe epigenetic factors is tilting that balance, that this NOx enzyme is being unnecessarily upregulated, pulling away from all those good things and making excess free radicals. Now, a lot of people tend to think, well, free radicals, they're bad. No, they're not. They kill the pathogens. They're signaling. Without them, we die of infection. But if they're in excess, that's when we have a problem. 
And Bob, no. I just wanted to ask you a question real quick. So that SOD you mentioned with catalase, which is really critical for decreasing free radicals, um, I noticed there's an SOD mutation. I happen to have that. Is that related to a downregulation of the production of SOD and catalase? Absolutely. Well, just SOD. There's cat, there's cat genes that make the catalase, yeah. and then there's SOD genes that, uh, that make the SOD. And what we find is that when people have a lot of mutations on SOD, they're, they're really struggling. And if you remember... When, uh, when we talked about peroxynitrite a month ago, you know, we many times showed that superoxide combines with nitric oxide to make peroxynitrite. Yes. And if we don't have enough superoxide dismutase that feeds upon itself, and peroxynitrite is a very oxidizing agent. Would that make sense? Again, I'm just always wondering, and based on some of my personal and clinical experience, I definitely have a lot of SOD mutations. And I've noticed that like hyperbaric chambers and uh, ozone, anything that creates some oxidative stress, I don't tend to tolerate well. Do you think that's co correlated with the SOD types of mutations? Oh, absolutely, yes. Because the uh, I'll be showing a, a map a little bit uh, later on here that shows how we need the SOD to turn some of those things into hydrogen peroxide and uh, well, why don't we just jump there now? I, oh, I love uh, this, that you go on rabbit trails with me. Now, one other question. Now, H2 inhaled, I know we both like that, and I use it almost every day after work for about 30 minutes. I sure. love it. Mm -hmm. But I'm assuming that is a pretty safe bet for someone like me with SOD mutations. Is there any way that that pathway could be overdone? With no, hydrogen? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. Hydrogen's very safe. So here is your, uh, your free radical superoxide. We need SOD to turn that into hydrogen peroxide. Then we need glutathione peroxidase that we spoke about, mm -hmm. thriodoxin, to turn this into water. And then we also need NADPH to keep recycling these guys. So if we don't turn this into water, and here's catalase that turns it into water and oxygen, it'll combine with iron to make your hydroxyl radicals. And that's where the hydrogen water or the breathing the hydrogen will neutralize these hydroxyl radicals. Because look what this guy will do. Combine with nitric oxide to make, oh no, peroxynitrite. Okay. And the yeah. same way here, if we don't have enough SOD, we make our, oh no, peroxynitrite, which suppresses the immune system, leads to osteoporosis, inflammatory bowel disease, on and on, and depletes our glutathione. So, uh, yeah, that's why I'm a big fan of hydrogen water and, uh, and breathing hydrogen. I just, uh, in prep for the show, I always try to like to have my, uh, my, uh, my brain as clear as possible. So I did about 20 minutes of hydrogen about an hour and a half ago, just to, uh, you know, I be on top of my game. I love it. And like I said, I do too. And I know people are always asking, so I'm going to get a practical really quick. I know you have hydrogen tabs for sale um, in your line of products. Um, so do I at my store. So make sure and check out Dr. Bob's on those. They're super easy. They're not expensive. You can put a couple tabs in water and while it's fizzing within about 90 seconds, you just drink it down. And I yeah. find that people who do that, it, this is a much more simple, cheap way to do it than inhaled. The inhaled is probably more powerful for sure. Um, but the machines cost in the thousands of dollars. Um, I got mine from High Tech Health. Um, I'm curious as to where you got your machine, Bob. Same place. Yeah, same same place. place. Okay. So you can go to High Tech Health if you're interested. But they are, yeah, they might be run upwards of $5,000 for the machine. So you can get the tabs for a lot less. <laughs> Absolutely. So these NAD levels decrease with age, and that's why the aging process takes a toll on us. Now, one of our researchers found it absolutely fascinating. Uh, they found that uh, perhaps the best time to take NAD is around 3 to 4 p.m. from a, you know, an oscillation uh, standpoint. Mm -hmm. Now, probably a lot of people have never heard of sirtuins. And we're not going to get into a lot here, but there's a process called acetylation and deacetylation. In a normal cell, these are, are balanced. In an abnormal cell, the acetylation is uh, weakened and the deacetylation is strengthened. And all of these, this is dependent upon adequate amounts of NAD. Now, we spoke about PARP, and that is DNA repair. So when peroxynitrite, you know, or other free radicals damage our DNA, again, what a miracle we are, Dr. Jill. We have the ability for the repair team to come out and start to fix us. And PARP does that. But look what it needs. It needs NAD plus to repair the DNA. So if we don't have enough NAD plus, 
when the cells get damaged, we don't have the ability to do the repair. So that's why that NQ01 is so important because if you're stuck in the energy production and not down in the NAD+, you don't have the ability to do that. So now would probably be a good time for me to uh, swing in a, uh, another chart here. And it shows the, uh, all the things that the NAD plus uh, does. So let me bring this guy over here. So here's your, uh, here's your NAD plus, which we spoke about earlier. But now in this chart, we show the downstream effect. Here is your, uh, here's your PARP enzymes, DNA repair. And in our talk on uh, peroxynitrite, we talked about how the peroxynitrite creates the carbonate radical CO3, which oxidizes the guanine. And then here's the sirtuins, sirt3. And look what this guy does. Turns glutamate to alpha ketoglutarate, which is energy, helps the urea cycle clear ammonia, stimulates the FOXOs that makes your SOD and catalase. So are mutations in SOD important? Sure they are, okay. But if the SIRT3 is not working or it doesn't have enough NADPH, you could have perfect SOD here and you're still gonna be low in superoxide dismutase. So that's why we have to look at this globally, not just SOD mutations, that's important, but it starts all the way back here. NAD plus feeds SIRT, feeds FOXOs, feeds SOD. So that's why the, I believe this uh, NAD plus is so important. But hang on to your hat, look what happens here, SIRT3 supports autophagy. SIRT1 inhibits mTOR. So we talked about this imbalance of mTOR and autophagy. So an inadequate NAD could actually be one of the contributing factors to this imbalance between mTOR and autophagy. And as you said, mTOR replicates cells. It's like a copy machine. It doesn't care whether it's a healthy cell, cancer cell, or a virus, it replicates it. And these two have to be balanced. Many factors that go into this, like over here is those enzymes we spoke about, and AMPK, there's a, there's a lot that gets involved in here. Uh, NERF2 regulates them all. But for now, we're just pointing out how NAD, lack of that, could lead to an imbalance of mTOR and autophagy. Good question, Bob, for your yeah. clinicians like myself. I'm assuming like insulin-like growth factor in the blood would be a way to measure like a, a offshoot of mTOR. Is there anything else that would tell us if we were measuring in the blood or serum or urine that would tell us status of mTOR versus autophagy in a real live patient in real time? That's the only one I'm aware of, uh, but I'm hoping that we're going to learn more as time goes on. Yes. Now, again, 3D chess game. The sirtuins that we talked about do all this protective things. PARP is needed to repair your cells. So the more you're, you're damaging your cells with peroxynitrite or other agents, the more your NAD gets tied up in PARP and is not available to sirt. So not only do we have to make sure we have enough NAD, we wanna make sure that we're doing all we can to minimize damage to the cells. And again, I'd encourage people to go back and listen to that other interview that we did a month ago, where we talk about the myriad of ways, even including EMF, that can cause uh, the, the, the damage from, uh, from peroxynitrite. And here's, uh, here's just showing how peroxynitrite, you know, stimulates uh, the PARP activation. So when the body makes that peroxynitrite, it says, oh, oh damage is occurring. PARP comes in. Again, what a miracle we are. You know, and God put us together, the miracle of being able to repair. But if we overwhelm that with too much peroxynitrite, uh, we, we just can't keep up. And that's when people break down quickly. You know, I'm sure we've all seen people that are, say, like 50 years old, and somebody looks like they're 35, and another one looks like they're 70. The difference being is the oxidative stress to the cells and the ability to, to repair. So, Again, that's why big fan of, uh, of NAD. Now, we, we already spoke about the uh, production of it. I just thought I'd show that one more time. These are, the, these are the steps. And these are the genes, TDO, IDO1 and IDO2, tryptophan, chironine to quinolinic acid, QPRT, a big one, 
grapeseed extract, interestingly, can support. So it's amazing how people can reduce their anxiety and make more NAD just by grapeseed extract if they've got mutations in QPRT. These are your final steps. And I already spoke about NQ01. And interestingly, there's, a, there's an old herb from South America, Pawdiarco. And it's a source of the beta latricone, which supports that conversion. And I've seen many people, like have tremors and other things, improve dramatically when they start taking Pawdiarco. So, so, Bob, I love that. I just want to comment again, clinical perspective, quinolinic acid, that's a bad one. I always hate to see that, especially with neurological, neurodegenerative diseases. We can actually measure in the urine, kynurinate, quinolinic acid, and 5-HTP metabolites and see what's happening here. But just like you were mentioning there, I find it hard in clinical practice to say, what can we do to stop that fire? It's a fire on the brain, fire in the nervous system. You mentioned um, grapeseed, so that's a powerful one. I've heard magnesium and NAC may have some. Um, is there anything else that we could do with quinolinic acid from a nutrient perspective? That's all, that's all I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. um, now, here's why it's so important that we understand this, because if you just start taking nicotinamide mononucleotide or nicotinamide riboside, and you're stuck up here, you can actually make things worse. Just a quick clinical study. I had a gentleman with, uh, with tremor. Nothing medically worked. I mean, they were ready to put probes in his brain, which he wasn't too excited about. We put him on Pawdiarco, about an 80% improvement. Then I said, okay, let's put a little bit of nicotinamide mononucleotide in. And as soon as we did, the tremors came back. Mm. So we actually had to back off here and just keep going with the Pawdiarco. So that's why it's so important to know if you've got NQ01 mutations, because you can think you're doing well by throwing this in because we all know the benefits of it. But if we're stuck here, we can make things worse. Hate when that happens, right? Yes. And again, I want to—I I love putting these clinical things in because again, I'm a wealth of guinea pig experience. Um, when I first got NAD, I was like, "Wow, this stuff is amazing!" And I felt so good. And just like you're talking about, you need folic acid, NAD, you need all of these different pathways. Well, again, as we already know from the the comment I mentioned before, I tend to be lower on my methylated B vitamins or historically have been. And after about a month or so, I started feeling more tired and more depressed and more a lack of stamina, like lack of energy. And of course, as you know where I'm going, I was depleting my methyl donors. And so patients who are very, you know, more, I would say fragile, although I don't like that word, like myself, they kind of walk this fine line. I find it's real important to make sure they have TMG, methylfolate, methyl B12, a few of the methyl donors along with, especially nowadays, we're pushing really high doses of this. So you've got to make sure you have um, any comment on that. And is that an experience you've seen happen as oh, well? Absolutely. Yeah, people who are low in methyl groups, I mean, this really is a form of niacin. Yes. So, uh, so you do need the methyl groups. And again, that's for the people that are, uh, that are under methylators. For the people that are over methylators, it probably helps them by yes. depleting some of those methyl groups. Again, one size does not fit all. Everyone's unique. So besides the MTHFR gene, is there any other things you'd look at with poor methylators versus, so uh, under methylators versus over methylators? Is there a few of the top genes you would look for with that? Well, yeah, I mean, COMT yes. uses, um, let's just take a quick peek here. Um, so COMT, catecholamine no methyltransferase, uh, needs SAMI. Okay. So if you've got a lot of mutations here, you may not be using the SAMI, possibly putting your, your methyl groups up. Now, I don't have a chart on this, but SAMI also turns into creatine, which is needed for your muscle strength. So if you've got mutations on uh, the, the genes that make the, uh, the, uh, the creatine, uh, you can also have excess methyl groups. And then conversely, if you've got difficulty with your MTHFR, MTR, or MTRR, you may not take this homocysteine back up through, and then you'll be low in SAMI. Now, everyone looks at MTHFR, but you got to look a little bit deeper. You've got your folate receptor sites, your DHFR, your MTHFD1. Is MTHFR important? Sure. But I've seen people with MTHFR mutations, and they're doing just fine. I've seen people without them, and they're not because the problem's way over here. Uh, or, you know, you might be chewing up all your methyl groups, because you're desperately having trying to have histamine and methyltransferase get out all this histamine. So if we don't have enough COMT activity, 
this is where your, your dopamine comes in. Now, look what weakens COMT, quercetin. So for some people, if their COMT is low, quercetin can make them worse. Estrogen, and of course, we're living in a sea of estrogen, estrogen and tyramine foods like cheese. Interesting. Yes, I've got another quick example for that. So I love my quercetin when I have allergies. And I remember when I used to take that and all of a sudden my cycle, I'd get breast tenderness, Bob. And guess what? I was inhibiting COMT and creating less detoxification for my estrogen. So I realized for me, again, there was a very fine line between too much quercetin and not enough if you have a COMT mutation. Absolutely. And then your testosterone supports COMT. So what's happening in the world today? We're living in a sea of plastics we're swimming in estrogen. And when I talk to, uh, to physicians who specialize in, uh, in hormones, they tell me, particularly in the young men, testosterone is dropping. Yes. And that's possibly why when you talk to college professors and you say, tell me about the freshmen coming in, you know, they're sensitive. They get upset quickly. They anger quickly. Well, if you're not clearing your dopamine, that could be happening. Now, there's many factors. Before we started the show here, we talked about how people are getting so angry speculative here, but perhaps if this is being weakened, we're not clearing our dopamine and people are just getting more angry. I mean, it's clearly multifactorial, but that could be uh, a factor in what's, uh, what's happening. And stress will affect COMT because you're going to produce more of those hormones too. So that's probably a factor we're seeing right now in this environment as well. Sure. Absolutely. Spot on. G6PD, extremely common in people with uh, Italian background, particularly Southern Italian, Native American, uh, African, very, very common for G6PD mutations, which makes your NADPH. And interestingly, just clinical observation, when people have Northern European descent and they make a lot of free radicals from iron, and they also have Southern Italian that they don't have enough G6PD, these are the people that are often very inflamed that nobody can seem to figure out. Uh, pattern that we see all the time. Excess hydroxyl radicals, G6PD mutations. Uh, interestingly, in, uh, I'm in uh, Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, where I work with the Mennonite and the Amish. And there is one group called the Martins that, well, let's back up. The, the Mennonites are primarily Swiss German. You know, and uh, however, there was three brothers whose name was Martino from Sicily, who converted to the Anabaptist Mennonites and their ancestors have these G6PD mutations. And uh, fascinating how you can actually, well, when I talk to people in the region, I'll say, is there a Martin in the background? And they're like, okay, how did you know that? <laughs> wow. Now, Bob, this goes really close to home because I grew up in central Illinois with uh, Albostolic Christian was the background of my family, but they were close, close Swiss German Mennonite relatives. So very, very similar from my background. I know that group. I know that people very well. And I know that these mutations do exist. And we have a lot of Martins that were neighbors. So very fascinating to hear oh, that. Today. Yeah. So, Martino, you'll notice. Yeah. I was you'll I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no go ahead. Uh, well, I wonder too, so the G6PD, we talked about Southern Italy. And in my studies, it seems that there is a correlation with the um, complications and infectiousness of COVID in relation to this gene. Do you have any insights into that? Or, no, uh, well, sure, let's think about what that does. That recycles your, your glutathione. Mm -hmm. So as we, well, not the G6PD, but the NADPH. Yes. So purely speculative hypothesis right that the more G6PD variants you have, uh, the less you're gonna be able to recycle your glutathione, the more likely you might be for that cytokine storm. Again, potentially hy hypothesis, maybe this is why African-Americans have yeah. more trouble because uh, the G6PD mutations are significantly higher in African-Americans. Yeah, again, really speculative, but that was my thought with Italy and the real difficulty they had in the beginning was I bet there's this genetic variant that's playing into that as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, keep in mind, Southern Italy particularly was closely tied to Northern Africa as people migrated mm -hmm. over. ME1 is also involved. IDH is also involved. So mutations in any of these could impact your NADPH. And again, I just uh, summarized them here, involves genetics involved in that uh, production. So how can we support it? Uh, niacin, nicotinamide riboside, nicotinamide mononucleotide, 
grapeseed extract for that quinolinic acid to NMN, and or Pauti-Arco for the NADH to NAD+. Now, phase one detox, maybe, maybe people have not heard of this, but there's something called the cytochrome P450s. And they're the very first step in detoxification. And what they do is they take toxins and they make them into something fat soluble. And then phase two comes along and puts them into water soluble. Look who we have here. NADPH is needed for that cytochrome P450 to work properly. So you, everywhere you turn around, you see NADPH. So if you don't have enough of that, even your phase one detox may be not as robust. We spoke a little bit about glutathione conjugation and uh, the GSTs is the glutathione S transferase. This is what takes the byproducts of CYP450 and then turns them into something water soluble. So if you have any mutations in GSTs, that's not gonna work very well. So here you can see what's, what's happening here. Here's your CYPs making your xenobotics and then your GSTs through phase two glutathione conjugation, put these toxins into stool or urine. But what do they need? They need glutathione and they need proper function of GLRX and you need the master control NERF2 and KEEP1 telling everybody to do their job properly. Now, once again, after it does that, it's oxidized. We'll go on and make peroxynitride if we don't. And here's our NADPH once again to the rescue to bring this guy back. So if we don't have enough NADPH, even this phase two glutathione conjugation won't be working. And this is one of the pathways that we take out many toxins, but particularly uh, mold. And I know that's something of uh, tremendous interest to you, Dr. Jill. Yes, fascinating, so important. Oh, and this is just some of the, uh, the genes related to the, uh, to the glutathione production. Now I jumped ahead, but I'll just take a peek at this again. Many people, particularly English, Irish, uh, Norwegian, have genetic mutations where they overabsorb iron. Interestingly, this was by uh, natural selection during times of famine, the people who overabsorbed the iron were healthy enough to have babies. So in times of famine, overabsorption of iron was helpful. Today, we don't have famine. We put a lot of iron in foods. So if you have that genetic predisposition to overabsorb the iron, and then you don't clear the hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyl radicals. Now, this is what we're going to talk about in a month, but I just wanted to give a preview of what's, what's coming up. There's a fascinating enzyme called NADPH oxidase, or NOx. Interestingly, it's got one job and it's to make the oxidizing agents superoxide and hydrogen peroxide. Now, why would we want to do that? When we're hit with a bacteria or a parasite or some other pathogen, again, God put in us the ability to put on a fight, to kill. So that's why all free radicals are not all bad. If we didn't have NOx, we would, you know, die of inflammation. It's helpful, okay? However, the overexpression or overactivation is a major role in oxidative stress and aging prematurely. So we have to, again, have everything in balance. Too much of anything can be harmful to us. So uh, if we have an increased cardiovascular disease, neurodegeneration, organ failure, cancer, and even autism. And here is a study that said targeting these reactive oxygen species sources with natural compounds may be an important tool. Now, here you can see, this is what we're going to get into in, in a lot of detail in our next talk. So this so I'm going to mention hard. now, I'll put this on as well, Bob, but so if you're listening, stay tuned. Um, August 28th, it's about four weeks away, same time, 3 p.m. Mountain, 4 p.m. Central. We'll be back, and this is what we'll be talking about on August 28th. Yes, and the reason I wanted to point it out now, because... I don't want someone to listen to this lecture and say, boy, I see all the importance of this. I'm just going to start taking some uh, NAD plus. Because what can happen, as we said, NADPH does all those good things that we talked about. However, when we're hit with a pathogen, the NOx enzyme says, hey, we got an invader here. Iron, give me some oxygen. NADPH, give me an electron. 
let's make some superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, stimulate the mast cells, stimulate some cytokines, some interleukins and histamine, and we're gonna kick up a fuss here and we're gonna kill this pathogen. Is that needed? Absolutely, without it we die of infection. So what we're gonna talk about in August is all of the epigenetic factors, we'll look at the studies on them, that can artificially upregulate this. Kind of like the, uh, the military that starts shooting the citizens rather than the enemy. And look who's here, nitric oxide and oxytocin. Actually, calm it down. Now, this is our latest research, and, and we've just started to talk about this. So your, uh, your people are some of the first to hear this. There's a substance called renin that is produced by, in the body to stimulate something called angiotensin 1. And then the ACE enzyme makes angiotensin 2. And that's why sometimes, I'm sure as a physician, you give people ACE inhibitors for their blood pressure. Then it makes something called aldosterone. And aldosterone causes you to hold on to sodium, excrete potassium, and hold on to water. But it stimulates NADPH oxidase, which then stimulates superoxide, stimulates hydrogen peroxide, stimulates mast cells, stimulates histamine. And again, when we've got a pathogen to kill after, that's a good thing. But if this is running rampant, this is where we create a problem. By the way, I put down here COVID comes in using ACE2. And ACE2 takes angiotensin 1 and angiotensin 2 and turns it into angiotensin 1-7, which is anti-inflammatory. Now, hold on to your hat. High glucose, peroxynitrite, histamine, dopamine, and mast cells all stimulate renin. And if you have genetic mutations in renin, it overreacts. If you've got genetic weakness in ACE2, it runs faster down this pathway. And I believe this research that we've done here is very clinically significant because, uh, well, let me first say that uh, I call this the NAD PhD. I've given it this name that when the NOx enzyme is overstimulated, the NAD pH in a sense is stolen away from its, all of its other good functions. So what do you think happens if NOx is upregulated and somebody also has genetic weakness that they don't make enough NAD pH? They're inflamed and they can't detox. Now, this is, I've just been, I'll be presenting this at some other medical conferences, but I think this is very clinically significant. I found literature on this, and we just you know, didn't come up with this on our own, there's peer-reviewed literature that shows that peroxynitrite stimulates renin. Mast cells stimulates renin. Histamine stimulates renin. So what do we have here? A vicious cycle of inflammation. And I've just come up with the name, the home cycle. This is uh, somebody that was uh, a relative of mine that uh, was influential. So I thought I'm gonna call this the home cycle of these three guys coming down, stimulating renin. So what does this do? This just feeds upon itself. So the more peroxynitrite we make, the more aldosterone. The more mast cells, the more aldosterone. The more histamine, the more aldosterone. This thing just feeds upon itself. And of course, you, you know, I know you're a big fan of making sure we have enough mycotoxins. Well, the mycotoxins stimulate the mast cells. Lime stimulates the mast cells. So all of these things can kick this off and that's why I believe some people, they're told that their Lyme disease might be gone, but they still feel horrible, purely hypothesis. But I have to wonder if this thing's just not feeding upon itself. So Bob, that makes so much sense. And I love this. And I'm so excited that we get to hear your brilliance here today as some of the first listeners on the topic, because I know this is going to be big. Now, one thought is we can measure aldosterone in the blood, and I've done that. And you and I have talked about different patients and said, you know what, we should probably measure. Is renin, do you know if we can measure renin? I've yes. Not, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what they are, but apparently there's proper ratios that should be in place. Mm. So again, mutations on renin will cause it to be overactive. Mutations in ACE2 will cause this to be underactive. And then 
you know, we're stimulating NOx and, and off we go. And of course, and the IL-6 in there too, which is a big player with COVID, which is a big player with many of my inflammatory patients and also is a genetic issue too for people. Oh yeah, you can have genetic mutations on IL-6 that are upregulation. And I was just going to point out, and maybe it's a little hard to see here, but angiotensin 2 stimulates IL-6, IL-6 stimulates NOx, and then NOx stimulates IL-6. Feedback loops all over the place. And I don't have it on here, but vitamin D helps calm down uh, IL-6. And then HMOX, hemoxygenase, also calms down angiotensin 2. So mutations on here can be a problem. And uh, hemoxygenase also calms down mast cells as well as uh, luteolin. So I think um, we may have come across something very significant here as to how these patterns occur. Now, purely hypothesis speculative, but when a child gets strep throat and perhaps starts this up, could that be a factor in why they go into pans pandas? I have no idea, but I'm just throwing that out as a hypothesis. Does something like that kick this off? And are many of the people that are inflamed that can't seem to get out of it, possibly going into that cell danger response, have this uh, going on? So again, in August, we're going to dig into histamine, oxalates, iron, glutamate, and how all of them stimulate NOx. And then we might talk a little bit about uh, interleukin-13, because when interleukin-13 is stimulated, if it's mutated, it actually comes back and makes more mast cells. And then if we have difficulty breaking down histamine, we can't break down that histamine. So again, 3D chess game played underwater, so many moving parts. So one of the things we're doing is we're experimenting with things that support ACE2, superoxide dismutase, things that calm down the mast cells, things that calm down the histamine. And preliminarily, a very, very good uh, results. So stay tuned. This is all, well, th this, this, this is not a hypothesis. There's all there's peer reviewed papers on all of this, but the hypothesis is, you know, is this something that's common that feeds upon itself? And we've got to continue uh, to research that, but my hunch is uh, it is. Gosh, Bob, I love this. This is so practical. And again, as a clinician who treats some of the toughest cases in the United States, this is this is the kind of stuff that we need as clinicians and uh, patients need because it's the it's the game changers. And if I were to kind of summarize big picture thing, I remember 10, 20 years ago when I started, I would get a patient coming in with hypothyroid Hashimoto's or menopause symptoms or a sore throat, simple, straightforward. We do an intervention and within two or three months, they're better. I never see those anymore. And part of it is the complexity, but part of it is what you just laid out here at the core is infectious burden and toxic load. In our environment, um, how I see it as the toxic load, whether it's EMFs or chemicals or estrogen disruptors, chemical you know, endocrine disruptors, all of these things are getting more and more in our environment. The stress is more and more, and um, our food supply is more and more adulterated. And then we have these old underlying infections. Number one, tick-borne infections are getting more prevalent because the encroachment of the, um, the types of vectors that carry ticks are coming into the city areas and the city areas are coming out into that area. So mm -hmm. most of the uh, swaths of places where you can get them now are widening. But all that to say, this toxic load is weakening our system, allowing old infections or new infections to become a bigger issue. And no greater... Um, example is it then right now with a pandemic, part of the reason why it's such a big deal is our systems are more weak than they used to be 100 years ago. So all that just to put it into place that toxic load, infectious burden, but I don't want to leave you hopeless. Great researchers like Bob are finding us answers clinically, and there are ways to decrease inflammation and change these pathways. So thank you so much for bringing this. And yes, I wanted to mention the conference. Tell us about the conference coming up. Yeah, September 18 to 20. Uh, so we were going to hold it live, but of course now we, we can't because of, uh, of COVID. So uh, we're so thankful you're going to be one of the speakers. But uh, Stephanie Seneff, who's brilliant, uh, she's going to be talking about a fascinating subject, and that is deuterium and how to get deuterium depletion and how that's related to some of these uh, inflammatory pathways. She's doing new research that she's going to present for the first time. Uh, Neil Nathan, you know, known for his mold, Sandeep Gupta from... Uh, Australia, speaking on mold remediation. Uh, two of the people at Nutrigenic Research have actually done literature reviews on the pathways that clear the mycotoxins. So in other words, 
Excellent. various mycotoxins, which uh, pathway might need to be supported. Of course, uh, this histamine wears out the adrenals. Joel Rosen is going to speak about that. Uh, Kay Rippey, again, part of the research team, is going to be talking about IL-13. Uh, Bill Shaw from uh, Great Plains, Mycotoxins 101. Uh, a new good friend of mine, Beth or uh, Andrew Campbell, is going to be talking about uh, mycotoxins and illness and some of his uh, testing. Uh, Beth O'Hara on mycotoxins and mast cells, Emily on oxalates relationship there, and then I'll be talking about the, uh, the cytokine storm. So since it's, uh, you know, across the United States, we're speaking, we're starting at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 Eastern, so the people on the West Coast don't have to get up too early, and uh, three days, and uh, $385, which we think is very reasonable. Very good. Yeah. Bob, so, I can't wait. I am excited to be part of it. I have been very, I'm writing my book, which will be out in about a year. And so I've been very selective at who I've told yes to. And you are, you are among the top because I love what you do. I love your platform. I love the information you're bringing and you always bring together really, really quality information. So thanks for what you do. Absolutely. Final thought here. Someone wants to talk to our clinic. Here's our phone number. Uh, if a doctor is watching this and says, you know, I'd like to do this genetic work, uh, there's the website, online certification. Here's our uh, technical support and uh, the supplements that we've made. Again, health uh, professionals only. They're uh, they're not available to the uh, to the general public. So if somebody wants to learn this, I have a a lengthy online certification course that teaches the the functional uh, functional genomics. So uh, what a blast this has been, Dr. Jill, like always. As always, so much fun. Thanks for going down the rabbit trails with me to get some practical information for people listening. I was looking at questions as so trying to um, monitor that as we went. Thank you, as always. I hope you guys will join us next month. And Bob, have a great uh, afternoon and evening. Okay, my pleasure. And looking forward to the next one.